Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our live webinar. My name is Christine Van Leeuwen and I'm a member of the Illuminating Engineering Society and a local Raleigh IES section member. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Illuminating Engineering Society Raleigh section. It's my pleasure to hand over the mic to Greg Johnson. Greg is a senior electrical designer with Loring Consulting Engineering with over 15 years of experience in the industry. His experience focuses on designing power distribution, lighting controls, fire alarm systems, predominantly for projects in healthcare and higher education. He's experienced in designing hospital patient care areas, including operating rooms, various medical imaging facilities in both new construction and retrofit projects. Without further delay, let me turn it over to Greg, who will introduce you to our speakers. Thank you, Christine. And thank you all for joining us for today's webinar titled The Importance of Color Quality Metrics and Lighting. White light quality metrics are critical to the success of both indoor and outdoor lighting, especially as LED lighting has become more mainstream in the industry. As manufacturers and suppliers begin including TM30 values on cut sheets, it is important for specifiers and designers to understand the meaning and details in each metric. This presentation will cover topics including an outline of the basics of the new color rendering standard, TM30, as well as highlight the major differences in other quality metrics, such as CRI, fidelity index, gamut index, and color vector graphics. I'd now like to introduce our presenter and panelists, uh, Lynn Davis and Wendy Ludke. Dr. Lynn Davis is a research fellow at RTI International leading research on solid state lighting device reliability and UV radiation treatment of spaces. Dr. Davis is currently serving on the IES testing procedures and lighting for seniors as the visually impaired committees. He also works with the State Construction Office for North Carolina to develop a guidance document for the installation of solid state lighting fixtures and new construction and as retrofits. And also our panelist, Wendy Lucky, is the product technology specialist for color at ETC and is a member of its advanced research group, ARG. She chaired the IES color committee for many years and is a member of both the ESTA TSP photometrics working group and United Scenic Artists Local 829. Ms. Ludke spent more than 15 years designing lighting for theater, live entertainment, corporate events, and architectural projects. She holds a BFA in technical production for, from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, where she later served for more than, 50, more than a decade as an adjunct instructor. Please note, if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat box at the bottom to write down your questions and they'll be answered after the Q&A, after the presentation and the Q&A and panel session. At this time, I'm pleased to turn it over to Lynn to begin this presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today um, and talk about the importance of color quality metrics in lighting. Um, I've got my contact information on this first slide. So if you have any follow-up questions outside the event, please feel free to uh, send me an email or give me a call. So today, what I want to cover in an outline is talk about color quality and how it's an important part of lighting. And I also wanna talk about some terms and definitions. Um, these are common words that we use, but they take on very specific meanings when we talk about standards. And I wanna be sure that we're clear on what those meanings are. Talk a little bit about how we represent colors in, in the different color spaces. And I wanna bring this all together by talking about four different lamps that we have tested in our lab and how they uh, compare and contrast both from the standpoint of their color rendering property or color rendering index properties or CRI, as well as with the new color rendering metric TM30. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about both CRI and TM30. We'll dive into a little bit more detail on TM30 and particularly go into some of the metrics that TM30 provides, including the fidelity index, the gamut index, as well as metrics for chroma shift and hue shift. And we'll talk a little bit about something called NXE. And then we'll 
uh, have some conclusions and there'll be some resources at the end if you want more information that you can uh, dive into. So let's talk about uh, how lighting impacts the appearance of a space. So this is a, um, a project that I was involved in a few years ago um, where we had a color tunable uh, white lighting uh, fixtures in the ceiling, as you can tell, two by two troffers. The color properties of these fixtures are, are mid-range CRI, so 85-ish. Uh, the color fidelity is about the same number, and it actually has a pretty good color gamut, um, 95. So since this was color tunable, we could change the color of the color temperature of the light in the room from a cool white, like you see on the left, to a warm white, like you see on the right. And this is just a composite of three pictures. And what you can see in this image is that same room, same chairs, same desks, same floor, everything's the same. But as we change the color of the light, um, the appearance of the tables and the chairs have now changed. Um, so this is something to consider when we're getting into uh, designing spaces. Uh, as a second example, uh, we have installed the same lighting system here at RTI where I work. And some of you, if you took the tour of RTI uh, uh, two or three years ago, um, may remember seeing some of these rooms. But here's, here's one of our conference rooms uh, under a color tunable light. And you can see how under the cool white light the at 6500K, you see certain colors pop, others are kind of muted. In particular, look at the blue chairs and the red blanket. As you go to a, more of a neutral white, a 4000K or even a warm white, you can see how the colors of those, um, of the chairs, of the blankets, of the uh, tables in the back, how they are all changing. And this is because of the color temperature of the light, as well as the spectral properties of the light. So. In considering this, it's not just about furniture and chairs and, and such. Uh, this also has very practical implications in, uh, in commerce. So getting the right color temperature and the right uh, color rendering properties. So you can actually go online and, and find lighting specifications for produce and food. So you see some examples here. If you've got more of a reddish uh, food item like a tomato or meat, uh, you may have more of a warm white color, whereas if you have a, an item like fish that that's, uh, has a lot of blue in it, you may go to more of a neutral to a cooler white color. Same thing in jewelry. Um, if it's a red gold ring, you probably want to light that under a warm white light, whereas if it's a diamond in a platinum band, you probably want a cooler white light because that will make um, the item you're trying to light sparkle more. So it's important to remember when we talk about lighting, we're talking about a source, we're talking about objects that the light from that source hits, and then it gets reflected into our eyes. So we have to think of that, that triangle, source, reflection, into the eye. So if we dive into how do we define colors? You know, there's, there's a couple of terms that are very important and their meanings are somewhat close to each other, but they are technically distinct. And it's important to understand the difference. And those two terms are hue and chroma. And I went to the um, IES website and got the official definition for hue. And it's the attribute that determines essentially what color something is. So if it's red, if it's yellow, it's green or so forth, that's the hue. The chroma is referring to how much, how colorful the hue is as judged by um, the proportional brightness to a similar, you know, to two different areas that are illuminated. So if we look at a color wheel and on the right, I have the Munsell color wheel. Um, we can now start to array the different colors in this color wheel. 
and start to define directions. So chroma increases this way. So if you look, these are moving straight radially outward. These are the same hue, but each step I'm adding a little bit more color and it's becoming a little bit more colorful. If I move in this wheel laterally or, or tangential to this chroma direction, now the hue's changing. You see it starts at blue, goes around to green, yellow, orange, red, purple, and so forth. So a radial change is a chroma increase and a hue change is more of a, uh, a change around the, the cir circumference or perpendicular to the chroma direction. And it's important to keep these straight, particularly when we talk about the color vector diagram. Also, it's important to, to note that this color space is three-dimensional. So the third dimension is actually whether the colors are lighter, which is at the top, or darker. And if you look going down this way, you can see the colors getting progressively darker. So actually, color is a three-dimensional space. When we think about lighting a space, the first thing designers usually think of is the correlated color temperature. And then we turn to how will a source render colors in that space. So originally we had the color rendering index and that's been around for about 50 years and came about because of the, the rise of fluorescent lighting and people realized that fluorescent lights rendered colors a little bit differently than incandescent and wanted some way to capture that. Uh, when LEDs came along, we found that CRI had a number of deficiencies that I'll touch on. Uh, and so that gave rise to metrics like R9. And I'll talk about that a little bit. But eventually, as we looked at the capabilities of LED lighting, we realized we needed a totally new standard, which gave rise to TM30. And TM30 has a number of uh, metrics, some of which you may find useful, some of which you may not use as much. The two fundamental metrics that we'll talk about today are the fidelity index and the gamut index. And so they, those are abbreviated as RG and for the gamut index and RF for the fidelity index. There's also local indices for chroma shift and hue shift that, that we'll also touch on briefly. So we're all used to this two-dimensional representation of color. You've probably seen these diagrams in the past. The one on the left is what is called the 1931 CIE color space, where colors are arranged in an X direction and a Y direction. So you can express colors as X and Y chromaticity coordinates. The one on the right is what is called the 1976 CIE LUV color space. And here, uh, you can see there's a little bit of difference in spacing, but here we, we can express colors in this space oops, by a, um, a U prime value or a V prime value. So you've probably seen on data cut sheets and so forth, X and Y chromaticity coordinates or U prime and V prime chromaticity coordinates. The reason why we have these two spaces is the original space, color space in 1931, actually has a fair amount of color distortion. You can see how big the green area is here, how small the blue area is, and so forth. So we went from 1931 to 1976, which, which was in a, an attempt to try and uh, create a more uniform space where distances in either direction would be close to a, about a comparable color change. So that is why we have these different color spaces. So we can represent color points by X and Y, by U prime and V prime. And the third way we can represent color points is this third bullet here. We can also represent color, particularly for white light, by giving it a CCT value, correlated color temperature, and specifying a distance 
from this line here, which is called the Planckian locus. So white light lies around the Planckian locus. So we can specify a color point of white light by giving it a CCT value and telling the distance from the, um, the Planckian locus. We call that distance DUV. I won't go into why it's called that, but that is just the terminology. So if we think about what do we really mean, let's dive into what we really mean by CCT. In reality, CCT is a shorthand for the spectrum of light of that color point. It comes from, if you think of uh, just heating up a fire, as the fire gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the spectrum actually changes. And in effect, what you're actually doing as something gets hotter is moving down this Planckian locus line here. So I can describe any color point of a white light by a CCT value, as well as a distance from this line. That's just as equivalent as describing it as an X prime or an X Y value or a U prime and V prime value. So with that background of CCT and spectrum and knowing the spectrum is important if you want to look at uh, color in a space, I wanna talk about four common light bulbs. Um, that each have different spectra and go through the implications of the spectral differences on color rendering um, in a space. So these four common light bulbs are an incandescent lamp, see just a standard A19 lamp, a standard LED equivalent to that A19 lamp, a special a19 lamp that has been modified to have no blue. And this was done in order to not excite the circadian receptors. So no, no blue whatsoever. It's still a white light source, but with no blue. And the fourth one, unfortunately, I couldn't find in an A19 lamp. I could only find this two foot tube is a special red enhanced LED lamp. So if we look at the efficacies of these, you know, as we expect, the incandescent is poor at 14 lumens per watt and CCT of 2750. The common LED matches the CCT, but has a much better efficacy. The no blue LED is a little bit warmer in CCT and, and a little bit lower in efficacy because of some of the trade-offs they made. And this red enhanced lamp actually has a little bit higher CCT at 3,400 uh, and a little bit better um, efficacy. So the point being that LED provides a lot of different spectral options that we couldn't get with incandescence and were very hard to do with uh, fluorescent lighting. So that is, that is why we need to, to have a metric like TM30 to let us rethink about color. So let's just look at those two um, those two equivalent lamps. So the, the standard A19 incandescent and the A19 L standard LED. So I've shown here on the left, the spectrum of the two. You see the standard spectrum for an incandescent lamp here in blue. It's low at 3,500 or 350 nanometers, which is in the UV, in the violet and blue, so forth green, yellow, up to red. It's putting out a lot of red radiation and even out into the IR. Um, whereas the LED, as we all know, this characteristic signature pump around 450 nanometers. Um, and then the emission from uh, the phosphors over um, uh, from 500 to about 750. So if we look at this, these two lamps, they're equivalent products, they put out almost the same lumens. We know from the last slide, the CCTs are the same, but you see the total radiant flux, the amount of radiant power um, that is produced by the lamps are different. The incandescent actually puts out a lot more radiant power, but most of it is in the far red and in the infrared, whereas the LED is putting out radiant power in a band more aligned with the visual receptors in the eye. And as a result, the luminous efficacy of the LED is much better. 
we see an impact in chromaticity as well because the spectrums are not identical. So if we plot those spectra on a chromaticity diagram like the 1976 one, what we see is there's about a one step difference in U prime and almost a two step difference in V prime. And not surprisingly, the uh, CRIs are different and even the fidelity index and gamma index values are different. And we'll get into a little bit more detail on these in a second. So if we're looking at how to determine the color appearance of an object under a light source, we know there's two metrics, CRI and the fidelity index. Now the definition of CRI, and this is important to keep in mind, is it's a measure of the degree of color shift of a test light compared to a reference source. So it's always compared to a reference source. And the reference source is almost always what's called a thermal radiator or a black body radiator. Fidelity index, well, before I get to fidelity index, I should also point out, we'll go to a little bit more detail in this in a second. CRI is really specific to only eight colors. The fidelity index now expands that eight color sample into 99 colors. And you're calculating a, um, a color match over 99 colors instead of just eight. And so the next question is, okay, that's fidelity index. What is gamut index? And, and gamut index gives you an idea of how broadly that light source covers the entire spectral range. And we'll get in a little bit more detail of this in, in a minute. But the key thing, while this sounds like a lot of terms, the key thing is these are all readily calculatable qualities, quantities. Uh, there are calculators that are available. All you need to do to, to perform the calculations is to get the what's called the SPD or the um, spectral power distribution of the source. And the manufacturers should be able to provide that to you. So let's go into exactly what is CRI. So again, it was developed around 1974, about the time fluorescence started to become prominent. And it, in short, determines how accurately a source renders eight moder moderately saturated colors. And only these eight colors that I've shown here on the top. It does not include any saturated colors, which is one of the shortcomings of CRI. So as a result, particularly as the LED lighting became in rows and prominence, ran into a situation where we had to use supplementary metrics. And that is where numbers like R9, R10, and so forth came from. R9 is probably the most common supplementary metric that's out there. You can do these calculations and I'm going to show you some examples in a second. There's a couple of good calculators available. The IES TM3018 calculator is available. If you do a Google search, you'll find it. There's also something called the NIST Color Quality Simulator and I'll actually show you some slides from that and it's available at this link here. Uh, and it's a very nice calculator and um, has a lot of good information in it if you want to do the math. It's pretty easy to use. So let's look at our incandescent source. So what I'm showing here on the top are the eight uh, CRI, the eight color tiles for calculating CRI. Here are the color tiles for the supplementary metrics. And here is the actual value. So the top color tile is the reference. So again, this is my black body radiator. The bottom one is the test lamp. So this is the lamp I'm testing. In this case, since I'm doing an incandescent light source, the two are identical. So there's no color difference between my reference and my test. All my color rendering values are 100. Okay, everything looks really nice. So let's go to the LED lamp. You can see here, if you just look at the color tiles, what you will see right away 
is red looks a little dimmer here. Hopefully this shows up on your screen. Red looks a little dimmer and there's actually what's called a chroma shift. So this red from the test lamps, not as bright as from the reference source. There's also a bit of a chroma shift in R8 here. So this um, mauve color is not quite as bright under my test lamp as it is under the reference. And so if I look at the bar chart down here of my rendering values, I see the R9 values greatly suppressed. So that's bad. Um, the R8 values also down below 60. Those are not particularly good values. Um, the overall color average is 81. So we may think that's okay, but we can see this light source definitely is deficient in red and would have some problems rendering red. So maybe you wouldn't want to use it in a supermarket or other places where, um, where rendering red is important. Okay, let's go to one where they have enhanced the red. And so here's the actual spectrum distribution of this red enhanced lamp. It's still an LED pump as the phosphorus, traditional phosphorus for an LED, but they add in these special phosphors here, to, which is responsible for these spikes. So this particular lamp, you can see now the R9 value comes way up and there's still a little bit of a chroma shift here. This is just slightly duller than that one, um, but you know, it's pretty close. Um, so it's pretty good. And the, the other values, all the other values across the board are, are pretty close, maybe a little bit off in blue, but all in all, this lamp is pretty close to our reference source. So there's not a, not a lot of difference rendering colors. So let's go, as the last case, let's go to the lamp that is specially designed not to have blue emissions. So on the right here, you can see this spectrum. So you can see there's no emissions at 450 and the 480 band. So they eliminate blue and cyan. There's a violet pump, uh, phosphor emissions. You can see a green phosphor and a red phosphor here. And on the left, you see the, um, the implications of, of this chain. So again, the top tiles are the reference, the bottom tiles are the test source or this blue deficient source. See here in red, hey, it did pretty good in red. So that, that's great. But where the problem comes in is blue. So you see blue has lost a lot of chroma. It's, it's much duller under the test lamp than under the reference lamp. And um, also, if you look at this, it's um, a little bit under on, uh, on this green color. It's kind of olive green color actually looks a little bit off as well. And you can see that in the bar charts down here, the screen color is below 70, blue is way down, but now red is over a 90. So this, this particular light source does great in, in red, doesn't do so good in blue. So if you, if you use this light source at my company, my company's logo has a lot of blue in it. That probably wouldn't go over well because it would not be rendered properly. Uh, so you would not want to um, use this light source in, in a lobby uh, trying to uh, illuminate the, the logo of my company. So if we look at the summary for CRI, it was developed about the time fluorescence came into dominant use, but the actual CRI metric only pertains to eight moderately satura saturated Munsell color tiles, does not include saturated colors. And that's one of the limitations of the metric. In order to get around this, we've come up with supplementary metrics um, for different colors, uh, R9 for red and so forth and so on. So let's spend the rest of our time talking about TM30, uh, 1920 or 2020 version. Um, so this has been updated from, from the 2015 version and calculates the, the required metrics of fidelity index and gamut. Um, but also talks about additional metrics, what's called the local chroma shift or RCS and the local hue shift, RHS. Now, when we talk about 
fidelity index and gamut index, we're talking about the entire group of 99 color evaluation samples. And I'll show you those in a second. When we talk about uh, a local chroma shift or local hue shift, we're only talking about a limited number of those 99 samples of very similar hue, hue values. We still have the color vector graphic in TM3020, um, but it's also TM3020, just for those that are interested, it's based on an even newer color space than the 1976 version. It's called CIE CAM02, and this eliminates any of the non-uniformities in the color space. So basically, if I move a direction in this three-dimensional color space, um, if I move in equal direction, then that's an equal amount of color change, uh, whereas the other color spaces do not have that. We also have a number of very good calculators for TM30. There is the TM3018 calculator that's out there. And just released is the TM3020 calculator. And I've got the links here. You can find it in two places on the PNNL website. And it just came up within the last week or so on the IES website. So here are the 99 color evaluation samples or CESs. As you can see, they have a wide var var variation in hue and chroma. So again, chroma is how colorful something is and hue is the different colors. So this, this metric, is able to take into account a lot of different colors and not just the pastel colors of CRI. So it's a much better and enhanced metric. C, um, CIE has also adopted uh, the fidelity index as well. And so in, in this CIE metric, you will is equivalent to um, TM30's uh, fidelity metric. So that raises the question of, okay, we understand the fidelity index, what is the gamut index? So let's, let's go back to these 99 samples. Let's plot them in three dimensional in a color space. And so that, you know, they're different hues, different chromas, different lightness values plotted in three dimensions. So now let's take that three dimension, three dimensional project or three dimensional graph project it down into two dimensions on the chroma hue plane. And this is what we're used to seeing with our other 1931 or 1976 spaces. And here are actually the 99 CES samples plotted in, in this plane. You can see where they lie. They kind of group around circles from reds to yellows, greens, blues, purples, and so forth. So we've got this in a two-dimensional plot like we're used to thinking about color. So, so we go from that and it's hard to look at how each of these 99 points change over time. So let's start to group them together. And we actually create the TM30 standard creates 16 what are called hue bin angles. H-U-E bin angles, numbers from one to 16. So one starts right here, has a lot of red in it, going around to green, to blue, uh, to purple. So let's take the, the reference sources that fall within these angles and there's, they're equally spaced, so 22 and a half degrees each. Let's take those points and calculate an average for that group. And so that is where these points here come from. And that's the actual color gamut. And it's kind of hard to, to look at a color gamut like this. So it make it a little bit more presentable, a little bit easier to understand at a glance. Let's normalize to the reference values. And so we'll have a test lamp and a reference lamp in all cases, will normalize to the test lamp. So for hue one, whatever the value is for that test lamp or reference lamp, that is going to be one and we'll scale everything 
accordingly. We'll do that all the way around. So for a reference lamp, we will get a circle with a radius of one. For a test lamp, it may be different. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Our incandescent lamp, as I said, that's a reference. So what you find, uh, reference illuminants are shown in red, test source in, uh, reference illuminants are shown in black, test source in red. What you find here is the red and black points are overlaid on each other because in this case, our 800 lumen incandescent lamp is our reference. Um, so the gamut is the same. And we see here, this is the TM3018 format. We see the fidelity index value here in the upper left-hand corner, the gamut index value in the upper right-hand corner. You also see a CCT because color is always tied to CCT. And here's the DUV value, which again is the distance of this color point from the Planckian locus. So this one's pretty easy to understand. Let's do one that's a little bit more complicated. Here's an 800 lumen lamp. Again, red is our reference illuminant. Black is our reference illuminant. Let me make sure I get this right. Black is the reference illuminant. Red is the test illuminant. And we can see a shift. And if we group these together within a color angle, we get these points here. So here's my reference. Here's my test lamp. And we can see that there's a shift. We can actually draw a vector to show the direction of that shift. And that vector has a radial component, so pointing to the center, and it will also have a tangential component. And so when I normalize these, I get my black reference circle um, for my reference lamp, this red distorted circle is my test lamp, and I can see where these two differ. So here, I'm this little arrow here, which is pretty much a radial arrow, means that this will have a lower chroma value under this lamp. This arrow here show, has both a radial and a tangential component. So this, for the color points in this hue bin angle, there'll be both a chroma shift and a hue shift. So if we look at what does all this really mean? Okay, let's look at these test sources. So here is an actual TM30 test report of the standard LED lamp. This has a little bit different format than what I showed a minute ago because this is a TM3020. They made some slight tweaks in the format. You still find the fidelity index and the gamut index in the upper left and upper right-hand corners. But the CCT and DUV values have moved to uh, just above the left-hand corner of the graph. And in the lower corners, we have the fidelity index for hue bin one. So that's this bin here. And we also have the chroma shift for hue bin one. Um, we know there's a chroma shift because um, this arrow is pointing inward. So that's a minus 12 for the chroma shift. And the fidelity index of just those fraction of the 99 uh, color evaluation samples that fall into this hue bin um, is 79. We can see here, this is our, uh, our reference spectrum, and this is our test spectrum. And here's a little bit more detail, actually, the specifics of the chroma shift for the different bins. So bin one all the way to bin 16, the hue shifts for bin one to 16, and the local fidelities for Q1 to Q16. And again, whenever I say local, what I'm referring to is that portion of the 99 color samples that fall within a particular segment of this diagram. <clears throat> I could also look at how well does this render the 99 colors as a whole? And that's actually the second half of the report that I'll show here. So this is how it does on all of the 99 colors if you really want that level of detail. 
You can also see this is providing the X and Y values, as well as the U prime and V prime values. And just for, for the sake of it, it's also providing a CRI value of 81 and the R9 value. So let's look at our other light sources as well, real quickly. Um, here's our red enhanced lamp, not surprising. It's pretty close to the reference, maybe a little bit of a chroma shift at in bin one, which is mostly red, but pretty close. If we look at our blue lamp, now here's where we really see the distortions and what the impact of the loss of the blue is. As you can see here, huge amount of distortion in bins 9, 10, 11, and 12, and that's also reflected in these graphs over here. There's also a huge amount of uh, saturation in bins four, five, six, and seven. And you can see how this distorts the color image. So like I said, if you had a space you were wanting to render blue, um, this is probably not the source that you want to use. But if you want to render a green or a yellow, maybe it does pretty good. The last thing I want to touch on in, in, the, in the next couple of minutes is Annex E. Um, Annex E is a way to classify light sources into three broad categories. And you may have seen these values at the top of uh, some of those uh, TM3020 reports that I was showing. So um, the three values are P for preference, V for vividness, and F for fidelity. And there's a... Um, a one level, which is the top in that category, a two level, and a three. And you can see here how each is characterized. Um, so P1 has to have a global fidelity index of 78, a gamut of at least 95, and the chroma shift for hue one, which again is the, the color bin that has a lot of red in it, has some limitations on it. For a vividness spec, we have to have a gamut that's at least 100. And for a fidelity spec, uh, the RF value has to be at least 85 and progressing up at, at the higher values. So if we look at our three test light sources, what we find is the, um, actually, I've got my labels here backwards. I apologize. The common LED lamp over here on the left has a P3 value, just barely meets the P3 value because of this chroma shift. Um, the red enhanced lamp, lamp does pretty well. It does certainly does better on our preference metric. So now it's up to our preference too. And because our fidelity index is over 90, we can qualify for an F2 rating. And the um, this is the no blue lamp. And I'll try and correct these when the... Um, presentation is sent out, actually scores a, a V3 because it has a very high gamut because of uh, this oversaturation here. And so the net effect is actually a, a higher gamut, a wider color gamut than the reference. And so it gets a, a V3 value. If we look at, you know, where can we find this on fixtures? Fixture manufacturers will have these reports. Um, they may be in either the TM3018 format or the TM3020 format, depending on when these cut sheets were made. But here is a typical cut sheet uh, that Wendy provided of a recessed fixture with a short to medium throw for architectural lighting. So you can see all the elements we've talked about today, the spectral power distribution, the color vector diagram. And again, this is in the, the TM30-18 format. Um, here are the um, uh, color fidelity values for the 99 CES samples. And here are the local hue shifts, chroma shifts, and so forth. And here are the, the PNF values as well for this particular lamp. So at a glance, this just gives you a great amount of information on the color renderings at various colors of this particular lamp. So with that, I want to um, just briefly conclude, you know, qu color quality metrics are important describing how a space will appear 
under a test lamp. They're always quoted relevant to a broadband thermal radiator or a uh, what's called a black body radiator of the same CCT value. CRI has been around for almost 50 years, um, and it really arose because fluorescent lighting wasn't as good as incandescent. With the rise of uh, LEDs, it gave us the opportunity to re-examine how we think about color and ultimately led to TM30. And the two fundamental metrics of TM30 are the fidelity index and the gamut index. Um, but you can take that information and do additional analyses. And that's the information contained in the color vector diagram, which is subdivided those 99 CES samples into 16 hue angle bins. And you can now quote metrics for those individual bins. So uh, you could quote a bin fidelity metric, which is abbreviated as you see here, RFH1, or a chroma shift metric, or so forth. And so last, I'd just like to leave you with some resources on, on just kind of pull these all together. Uh, nomenclature, some of the calculators. I'd also like to point out that if you would like additional information and go into a lot more detail, our panelist, Wendy Lukey, has a very nice um, course, short course on the ETC website. The link's given here. You have to set up an ETC account, but uh, it's certainly worth your time. She does some very nice demos, definitely worth seeing. And there are also some presentations on the IES website if you're interested. So with that, I would like to turn it back to, to Greg and proceed with the program. Thank you, Lynn. That was a very informative and interesting presentation. This time, I want to go ahead and pass it over to Wendy Lucky. I have a couple comments, and then I'm going to dive right into the questions. Uh, I, in my work, I really focus on the spectral content of light sources, uh, chromaticity, and color point. These are just this is one tiny aspect of appearance to me. Um, CCT, in my view, is it's a it's so limited. It's a marketing term, right? If you just see something as 3200, it, it, it's anywhere in that quadrangle. If you add DUV, it's so much better for you. Um, and if you have the actual CCT and DUV, then of course you get color point. Um, so for anyone on this call uh, participating today who doesn't normally use DUV in their practice, I would strongly encourage you to please begin using DUV in your practice. Uh, it's so important. Um, but today we're focusing on color quality, which is about rendering. And I think that it's important to remind ourselves to think about the spectral properties of any light source that we're specifying. Um, you know, an object can only reflect the light that falls upon it, right? So if an interior designer spends a lot of energy with their client finding the perfect marble or granite because it has some streak running through it, right? Or some flex of color, you wanna make sure that the pendants you are putting over that or you know, whatever light is on top of that marble is gonna accentuate those colors. Uh, that is that is our job as the lighting team, right? Um, if there is some some wood, uh, if there are humans that are going to be going through the space, if you if you specify a source that doesn't have long wavelength threads, those things are really going to suffer. Uh, so again, we want to make sure that the sources that we're specifying have these properties uh, in them, right? Um, Christine, when we were prepping for this session, gave an example. Uh, is that baby jaundiced or is the lighting just bad, right? <laughs> uh, we've all probably at least once purchased a piece of clothing we thought was blue and got it home and it was purple uh, or some other color change, right? That was just about the lighting. Um, so color quality uh, or to maybe say, maybe more specifically address color rendering how we are making the objects in our environment look. This is a complex question. Uh, and CRI, I hear all the time, I know this question came in, CRI is so simple. Uh, can't we just have something so simple? No, uh, it is, a, it is, I'm being catty here, but like it's, it, it is a complex question and therefore it is a complex equation. And therefore, if you drill it down just to one number, it is, it is oversimplifying and you cannot see the whole picture. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this opportunity to um, uh, 
Jean, I'm gonna, Jean Mercer Ballard, hopefully it's Jean and it might be Jean. Uh, you asked a question that, that it's so perfect. It's as if I paid you to ask this question. I get this all the time um, about the complexities of TM30 versus the simplicity of CRI, right? Very, it's very simple to teach CRI. Um, I think the reality of that is it's very simple to teach what we think CRI gives us. We think, we commonly believe CRI is one number that tells us, is this light good or bad? And that's not what it tells us at all. Um, number one, the math is flawed. Lynn addressed that, right? The math is flawed. So first of all, the underlying calculations are flawed. We need to stop using it, full stop. But I'll continue. <laughs> TM30 fixes those. Uh, it's a very black and white issue. But number two, it is, it's only a fidelity metric. Um, all it tells you is, do they match? Does this light source make those eight samples look the same as they would under this light source I'm considering specify, right? This re uh, reference versus what I'm thinking of specifying. Does it make those eight swatches look the same? A 90 means they look, you know, close. 80, they're a little further away. But what is the distortion? You have no idea. Is it going to make the orange in your fruit bowl look yellowish or reddish? Ugh. Is it going to look like it's actually a piece of plastic from the craft store or like it's decomposing and needs to go in the compost? Any one of those scenarios could be true with the CRI of 80. You, you simply don't know. It doesn't offer any clue. Uh, and so TM30 does fill in, try to fill in those gaps and offer you that information. You know, some of those differences might actually be preferred. If you have um, a fresco or a mural, uh, and you're looking at a CRI number of, uh, and by the way, CRI generally, we're referring to RA, right, which doesn't include R9 at all. It's again, only those eight. So if you say, well, I have a CRI of 80 or 90, you don't know what those differences are. You could have a fresco that looks like it was painted in a very vibrant way, appropriate for a theme park. You could have a fresco that looks like it's 200 years old and has been fading in the sun. You could have the sky sort of shifted toward a cyan. You could have clothing that's, you know, was supposed to be purple and it's shifting blue or red and you simply don't know. So it is, it is a more complex question than that. And I think it's really important that we all step up to the plate and appreciate that and understand that it is harder and we, we're gonna have to do some work. Um, NXE took a big step forward uh, in trying to address the, okay, this is a bunch of numbers, what do we do with them question? Because because just to have a stack of numbers, what do you do with them? Um, this is also where I'm gonna ask for your patience as I am, you know, the color committee, this is a new standard. CRI has been around for decades, right? TM30 is around is seven years old now. And so it does take time. So we don't yet have an RP that says, if you're doing a cafe, you want an RF of 90, an RG of 105, and an, RCH, uh, an RCS H1 of plus 5%. We don't have that discrete application yet. Um, we are getting there. We are continuing the work. Annex E was based on actual research for what people preferred, for example. Um, CRI was not based on actual research, by the way, uh, but the IES is, you know, the members of the committee are doing research. Uh, sorry, there's a fire truck coming by um, to try to base it on real things. And that will simply take time to weave its way into the standard. The committee does continue to work on that, um, but I would encourage you to read Annex E because it does offer guidance. It doesn't tell you the answer. It still, puts, it still puts the burden on the specifier to say um, of the design intent, right? Uh, what are your priorities? If you're working in a healthcare facility, facility, fidelity is probably the most important. But in a restaurant, preference is probably a little bit more important um, than fidelity. And in a theme park, there's probably certainly applications where vividness is your number one. Um, so there is still work to be done, but it is, it is getting there. Uh, I would... I would encourage you to take advantage of the seminar that Lynn uh, put up on the resources slide. Uh, it, it, is, it is free, 
absolutely free. First of all, the TM is also free. Um, the let me jump back. I meant to also say the the webinar is a, a, uses TM thirty eighteen. Um, I have not yet updated it for TM thirty twenty. But there are no mathematical changes between the eighteen and twenty version. The reason that it got a new year tacked onto the end is because the IES moved to the online lighting library. And so everything went back through the process and got a new date. Um, there are two changes that did happen in the course of that transition to the online lighting library. One, the, um, the annexes that had been published separately are now part of it. It's all one document. You don't have to download separate things anymore. Number two, that PVF information got integrated into the report templates. So when you publish a short and intermediate or a full report, the PVF stuff now does have official locations. Um, the, the, the report that Lynn showed was, was our attempt to get that information out there, even though it wasn't, it's not included in the template in the 18 version. So we plopped it on the top. Um, but so that's it. So, uh, so that's the TM3020. It is still free. You do not need a subscription to the lighting library to get it. Okay. Um, don't, I don't, we didn't want anybody to think that, there, you know, there's no financial hurdle for anyone. Um, the webinar is also free. You do have to put, you know, make yourself a login, uh, but it's, but then it's, it's free, totally free. And it does take out as much talk of the science and the math as possible to try to keep it accessible for um, designers and specifiers who are like, you know, blah, 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 math, just tell me what it, what's the answer, right? <laughs> uh, I try to keep it, you know, application to relate it to real world applications. Like, do you have a lot of wood in your environment? That kind of thing. Um, uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, I know it's, it's hard, I know it's hard, um, uh, but unfortunately, yes, but we can do it. We're smart people. <laughs> Yeah, we have a, another question. Um, uh, one is, a, what new metric is gaining traction with designers? I mean, I think TM30 is. I think I am seeing it published more and more. Um, manufacturers are more and more willing to publish it if you ask for it. Um, oh, I do think somebody else asked, there was another question, or maybe it was another part of Jean's, that, that the information wasn't always available. Um, with anything new, if it's not required, you know, manufacturers have only so much time, right? Marketing departments can only do so many things. So for example, what we are doing is publishing those reports as we release new products. And if somebody wants that information for an older product, we'll, then they just send us a note and we'll generate it. But we're not going to go back and do the cut sheet again, unless there's some other update. Um, so I think as we continue to see new products, we're going to start to see that information made more available. Um, I feel like I feel like it's it is gaining traction. RF was also adopted by the CIE, which is the international. Um, so RF is now a standard piece throughout the whole community. Um, I do. I yeah. I think I I do feel like it's it is gaining some traction. I don't know if there are any others. Um, I know I don't know. Somebody asked about well in a different session. Um, I think that it is working its way into well and um, the DLC stuff, although I'm not sure if it actually has been um, adopted formally yet. Maybe somebody, if somebody who's listening knows the answer to that and add it in the chat. <laughs> um, we have another question here. Uh asking to hopefully to explore the PVF information a bit more and not clear on how they are meant to be applied and the scale is three better than um, having the dash or no value? Uh, yes, yeah, so a three is better than a dash. So one is best, highest, two is next, three is the bottom and null is, is didn't even, didn't make it. Um, so for example, if you had uh, an F1, that is the highest fidelity section. F2, it's, you know, still like, that's still, that's still good. You still, still pretty good. F3, well, how much do you really care if there's a bunch of distortion? F null, dude, it's a different light. <laughs> if fidelity is important. Now, if vividness is important, is the, is number one. 
if vividness, vividness is like, I need to make this look like a hyper cartoon. Um, if you are on purpose making it super vivid, you are by definition distorting the colors, right? And so you will get a poor fidelity score because you are intentionally creating this match. Um, but one is one is best or highest, three is lowest, and null is null is essentially four. I can't see the chat box now. The chat box says, "Can you bring back the PVF slide?" Um, so is it used similar to apply a, to applying a bug rating? As in balancing your needs, yes. As in balancing your needs, absolutely. You so so look at the design intents, right? If I'm lighting a, a cafe, preference, vividness, fidelity. What are how would I rank these in terms of most to least importance? If I'm in a restaurant or a cafe, the most important thing is for the people to relax, enjoy themselves, stay longer, and buy more food, right? Um, so preference is probably number one. I want everybody to like how they look there, like how the food looks. Fidelity is probably number two. There is food involved. I need it to not look weird. Um, vividness, not super important. So I would be looking for a source um, with a you know P1, F2, B3, for example. Um, if I was in a hospital setting, I want F1. But then I also want people to feel as good as they can, so P2, right? Again, vividness not a criteria. If I'm in a theme park, then maybe I want it to be P1, V2, because I do want everything to pop a little, and fidelity is less important, F3. I need it to not look super weird, but that's my lower priority. Um, I think, hopefully that helps. It's also a lot simpler, I think, to think like, do I need a P1 or an F1 is a lot easier than thinking RF 86, is that good? Or 90 or 84, and I need an RG and an RCSH what now? The PVF simplifies it a lot. <laughs> Greg, on behalf of Greg and myself, Lynn and Wendy, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you to all of our members who joined us. Um, honestly, without you guys, we wouldn't be here. So thank you to our IES members who attend every month our webinars and our lunch and our uh, lumens and loggers. Um, and there should be an email going out from uh, Mai soon about our upcoming programs. And thank you again so much, Lynn and Wendy, for being on today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all and have a great day.